I love these things, graham crackers. I mean, who doesn't love graham crackers, right? Whether you eat them plain or as a snack, uh, dipped in milk, my favorite way, dipped in water, uh, as a pie crust, they're, they're just delicious little treats. But they haven't always been delicious. In fact, they were purposefully once made to not be delicious. That was the aim, to not allow them to be delicious. Sylvester Graham is known as one of the first fad diet creators in the United States. It was the mid to late 19th century, and the typical American diet of today was just coming into form in that day. Fatty, greasy, sugary foods were becoming commonplace. The meat and potatoes kind of diet was taking, was taking its place as the American diet. And Graham came to the forefront uh, railing against eating this type of food. He was a strict, no meat, no eggs, no cheese, no alcohol type of guy. And yes, while he believed in health principles and strongly advocated to eat healthy, his main focus was not to be physically healthy. His main focus was not to be healthy per se in the things that you eat, even though that was a big part of it. His main focus was that, uh, that no one should enjoy the foods they were going to eat. He believed that the enjoyment of food, the taste, was to give satisfaction to the sinful, selfish, sensual side of lust. Food was meant only for nourishment, never for enjoyment. <laughs> this guy obviously never had tacos, right? I mean, who could give up tacos? But I'm very thankful that while he inspired some early Adventist thought on health, we didn't take up that side of the argument that food should never be enjoyed. So when he produced the graham cracker, he stuck to this belief. The original graham crackers were made of what was called graham flour. Graham flour was whole grain, whole wheat. And I say it that way for purpose and reason. It was unsifted, ground, whole wheat. Meaning that it, it quite literally still had whole grains in it. Chunks of wheat were still in the wheat flour. And so it had graham flour, just a little bit of oil to mix it together, and just the tiniest little bit of salt just enough uh, salt to make it swallowable. Far from anything they are today. Far from anything delicious. These sweet, delicious, heavenly crackers that we have today are nothing like the graham cracker of yesterday. Now, we can only imagine what the food in the Garden of Eden must have tasted like. I mean, in this case, we can probably stretch our imaginations as far as they can go, because when it comes to perfection, nothing is with, uh, within the realm of possibility. It is more than we could describe, more than we can imagine, and the food of heaven, the food of what was in the Garden of Eden, the food that we will partake of in heaven will be nothing we can describe today. I mean, we can use the simplest word and just let it run its course. It will be delicious. It will be for nourishment. It will perfectly nourish us. But I am positive that the food of heaven will also be incredibly delicious. As far as that word could stretch in our imaginations, it will be further than that. It will neither be like the old graham cracker or the new sugary deliciousness at mess of today. It is something that we could never recreate on our own. Not the greatest tacos, forget graham crackers, 
tacos, not the greatest tacos, not the greatest lasagna, not the greatest pizza, not the greatest uh, orange tofu, nothing. I mean, the greatest foods. I'm a big sandwich guy. I love sandwiches. Some, some veginase, some vegan turkey. Oh man, that, and some veggies in there. I love sandwiches, but not even the greatest sandwich. Capriotis, by the way, that, that's where you find the greatest sandwich. Not even the greatest sandwich can compare even 1% for the food that, is going, that we're going to eat in heaven. So I, I, I bring this up to ask you this very important question. If we cannot even recreate the food that we're going to have in heaven, how do you or I think that we can recreate the character of heaven on this earth? What is, okay, our world wants to be a better, safer place. I want it to be a better, safer place for all. But how can we achieve that here if that perfection is found only in heaven? Notice how the Bible describes our eternity. Isaiah chapter 33. Uh, to, be, to be fair, it is describing what heaven is now the government of heaven, the establishment of heaven. But of course, heaven hasn't changed, isn't changing, won't ever change. The character of God yesterday, today, and forever, right? Isaiah 33, verse 5. Isaiah 33, verse 5 says this, The Lord is exalted, for he dwells on high. He has filled Zion, heaven, with justice and righteousness. Heaven is filled perfectly, 100% with both justice and righteousness. We cannot recreate that here. We should strive for it. We should desire it. We should do everything possible for it, but just the same with food. We want to be healthy. We want to have better habits with our food. We want to make better decisions with what we eat and what we drink, but nothing can compare to the nourishment and the deliciousness of heaven. We should strive for justice and righteousness and desire and do everything we can to partake of it. But what heaven has is so much bigger and greater. I want you to understand today that this is what the world is begging for. This is what people are protesting for. They want justice. They want righteousness. I want with them. I want justice and righteousness. The world doesn't even realize that what they're begging for is heaven. What they're desiring is Jesus. Family, it is our job to show them heaven on earth the best we can, to show them the character of Christ on earth the best that we can. The world claims it can offer it. Political parties claim that they can give it. People argue how to achieve it. But there is only one form of justice and righteousness that is perfectly fair for all. And that is the character of heaven. That is what people are longing for. Is it today, right here, right now, what you are longing for? Is it what you are striving for? Is it what you are desiring? I want us to be almost able to taste it, to enjoy it, and to share it in all that we do. This is why we have been studying how to survive these stressful moments, these trials. And the world is in a trial. Our country is in a huge trial, in a massive stressful time. And honestly, it doesn't seem that there are many people handling it the right way on both sides. 
People are striving and promising that they can deliver, but none can but Jesus. This life is in turmoil. This world, this culture is in turmoil. People are hurting. People are stressing. People are mourning. People are fighting. And the church has what the world needs. Jesus is what the world needs. We cannot find the joy, the justice, the righteousness, the peace that eternity will present. But it is our job to always strive for it. We must strive for it. But where does that desire begin? Where does that pledge begin? Where does the hope of justice and righteousness begin? That is our question today. The world is filled with injustice and unrighteousness, and the world needs you and I to step up and to show them Jesus. We can survive this life, and we can thrive into eternity only through Jesus. So far, we have learned in part one that God prepares us for turmoil. God knew that the turmoil of today in the United States was coming, and he prepared the country by having it, by establishing it on Christian principles. So where is the church today? In part two, we learn that we must know the scriptures, that it is in the scriptures that we find strength for our turmoil. Part three, God knows what is best for you today and tomorrow. In his infinite wisdom, he sees all that you need from moment to moment. And he weaves it together perfectly for us. Part four is now our reaction to that. God knows he is prepared. Part four was that we have to be alert and respond to God's directives. Part five, don't have faith in you or in me. Have faith only in him. Part six, lean upon your heavenly mediator. We have one. His name is Christ Jesus. Part seven, we were, we were reminded to cast our cares to him, just as the disciples cast their empty nets towards him, because he cares for you. Part eight, remember what God has done for you. Look back and see the times that he has led you. Today we will learn our ninth principle as we ask ourselves that question. Where does the hope and the desire and that striving for justice and righteousness in the world, where does it begin? We are called to be filled with righteousness by faith. Let's define that. Paul is the one who uses that, uh, that terminology, righteousness by faith. He does so in Galatians chapter 5. Galatians in the New Testament, Galatians chapter 5. Now he uses it later on in the chapter, but he defines it earlier. So we're just going to read the definition that is Galatians chapter 5 and verse 1. It says there in Galatians 5, 1, Stand fast, stand strong, stand firm. Therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free, and do not be entangled again with the yoke, the burden of bondage. We are in bondage to sin. It is a heavy yoke. Uh, both the way that that word yoke is meant, a heavy doctrine, it is everywhere, it is the culture of the world, sin. But also in its bondage, its, its grasp on us, its prison over us and our culture. We are in bondage to sin. However, Christ has set us free. Not a work in our own works, but his work. 
Christ has set us free. We are at liberty. Christian, we are not at liberty to sin, but we are at liberty from sin. We have been called out of the darkness and into his marvelous light. You and I are not called to uh, harness his light within the darkness of sin. We are not called to be sheltered in sin, but free of its burden. How? He is powerful enough to forgive and also to lead us to victory. It is his ability alone. That is the core idea of righteousness or living right correctly by faith. Trusting in him. So, where does the justice begin? Where does the righteousness begin? Where does the faith begin? Well, let's look back at our beginnings as Adventists. As Adventists, this is an important phrase. This phrase, righteousness by faith. It dates back into our history. By the 1880s, the church had become incredibly legalistic. All we seemed to talk about was doctrine. All we seemed to talk about were the Ten Commandments. All we seemed focused on were the Sabbath. In fact, many within the church were using that as a dividing line between who was saved and who was lost. If you kept the Sabbath, you were saved. If you didn't keep the Sabbath, you were lost. It had become very, very legalistic. But faithful students of the Bible began to rise up. And a reformation of sorts was, was taking place in the church. Faithful Bible students were turning to the Bible, specifically to the writings of Paul, specifically to the book of Galatians. And they were, uh, I don't want to say discovering, but they were re refreshing their minds in the news that it is Christ that sets us free. That he is the righteousness of our faith. And so an important conference was called in the year 1888 in Minneapolis, Minnesota. A perfect place for a discussion on righteousness by faith and the need for Jesus this week, right? A beautiful presentation was made by A.T. Jones and E.J. Wagner concerning the promise of righteousness by faith. And, and, and when I say beautiful, I mean, you can't beat what they did in their rebuttal to, to an argument against them. They grabbed 16 Bible verses, 16 Bible verses, and they just simply took turns reading them. They let the Bible speak for itself. It is, it is Jesus that we need, was their message. He, and only He, can fill us with His righteousness. Yet, sadly, incredibly sadly, while no vote to either accept or reject what they said that day took place, many treated them with contempt, with hatred, with vileness. In fact, Ellen White, who was there, said it was the, one of the worst days of her life in terms of how she was treated. They were shunned. Their message of Jesus was blocked by the walls of Sabbath prejudice. Some of their supporters said that they had never been treated with such contempt in all of their life, in all of their lives. They were surrounded by brothers and sisters in the Adventist faith, yet they were completely alone. But, and that's a, that's, a, that's a wonderful, wonderful phrase. However, but, what the supporters of righteousness by faith did not know that day, what they did not experience that day, 
what they could not evaluate that day was that the Holy Spirit was moving powerfully in the hearts of those who hated them. That they presented the message of Jesus Christ, the message of righteousness by faith. People scorned them. People hated them. People mocked them. But those same people turned and went home with the Holy Spirit moving strongly in their hearts. Many that day would later admit that they walked out angry. And yet, the more the message moved upon their heart, the more they realized that we are saved by righteousness in faith. The more they debated it, the more they thought about it, the more they realized the truth of being made righteous through the forgiveness that Jesus Christ only can give. What once tasted like a traditional old school graham cracker in their mouth with contempt ugh, slowly became sweet and delicious like these honey-made crackers of today. Righteousness by faith became the heart, the pumping, beating, living heart of the message of our church. Righteousness by faith. That we, yes, keep the Sabbath, but we do so because Christ has saved us. That all the things that we do, all of our doctrines, Take us back to Jesus Christ. So I want to ask you today, why do you think this happened? I mean, could God have, have, have done some miraculous huge miracle that day as A.T. Jones and E.J. Wagner were preaching? Could he have done some magnificent show that he was with them? Could fire have fallen from heaven and maybe lit some candles on the stage or whatever? Could he have moved powerfully? Could, could flames of, of fire have landed on their heads? Could he, have, could he have moved the crowd that day powerfully immediately in that moment? Why did not the Holy Spirit just convince them that day? Why did the Holy Spirit move so slowly upon their hearts to accept the powerful truth of righteousness by faith. Here's what I believe wholeheartedly. If the Holy Spirit had moved powerfully that day, the crowd would have walked out believing that they accepted the truth of righteousness by faith because they had accepted the truth of righteousness by faith. They would have walked out feeling that A.T. Jones persuaded them. They would have walked out glorying in the message of E.J. Wagner. They would have, they would have you know, shared the good news that they were, uh, had been inspired by the words of Ellen White. But God did not want them to believe that any one person had persuaded them. They would not have felt the work of God in their hearts as powerfully if they had done it that day. I, I want to say that again. Even though it would have been a powerful movement to feel the work of the Holy Spirit that day, it would not have been as powerful as it's slowly churning in their hearts. <laughs> this is the truth of all truths here about this matter. They were persuaded to believe in righteousness by faith through the work of righteousness by faith. They accepted the message of righteousness by faith through the slow inner workings of the Holy Spirit, which is the gift of righteousness by faith. They were saved and, and brought to liberty from their false doctrines, 
from their pride and prejudice. They were saved from it by the work of the indwelling spirit of God. God moved upon their hearts. Friends, listen, this is so powerful for you. I know this is history, but this is powerful for you today. Here's why. Catch this. I know some of us are feeling like, man, all I do is mess up. Man, all I do is sin. All I do is gossip. All I do is this, this, is whatever it is. We just keep falling back on our old parents. Listen, listen to this. The crowd scorned his message. They mocked his preachers, but he did not quit on them. He filled their hearts and he filled our message with his righteousness. Righteousness is our hope. Righteousness is our future. Righteousness is our gift from him. Righteousness is, call, is, is to be our desire. They hated his message, but he didn't quit. If you're worried about your heart today, you're in a better boat than they were. They hated his word. They mocked the message. Now, maybe it's possible you're in that boat. But if you're worried about where you walk, walk with God, if you are worried where you stand with God, if you're worried and, and, and self-evaluating your own heart, you're in a better boat than they were. And if God did not quit on them, he will never quit on you. He will never stop believing in you. He will continue to pour out his Holy Spirit in your life. There will still be a slow, gradual change. He knows his timing. He is patient with you. Be patient with yourselves and continue to look upon him. When his righteousness covers us, we are ready for what lies ahead. The trials we are going through, we need his righteousness to cover us. Again, as we've been studying the stories after the resurrection of Jesus, uh, it will continue to teach us a, this lesson for our spiritual, physical, and emotional survival through the trials of life. We left off last time with, with Jesus on the shore. At least some of, likely all of his disciples, there at Galilee on the boat, they turned, they saw it was the Lord. Remember, Peter jumped out of the boat, swam to the shore. Peter now is, is likely drying off by the fire. And they were all eating breakfast. They were feasting on bread made by Jesus and fish provided by Jesus. I really hope you've been following this series. It's been so powerful. I have, I have really needed this study. And I hope you've been blessed too. I, I've really needed this study. Life has not been simple. It has been difficult to navigate lately for lots and lots of reasons. God has really been moving upon my heart. It's really given me a lot of courage. And I pray it's been the same for you. But I don't want you to miss that point. They're now sitting there by the morning campfire, and they're eating breakfast made by the hands of Jesus. He, he made the bread. Jesus uh, uh, provided the fish from the, from the sea. Their net was empty all night, but then he says, go ahead, bring up your net. And it was full, full. But then Jesus breaks the silence as they're all kind of eating this delicious food and wondering what's going to happen next. Jesus breaks the silence and speaks to Peter who is standing in front of him. Why did Jesus need to speak to Peter in front of the disciples? Well, at this point, the disciples knew what Peter had done. 
Peter, who was called to be a leader in the church, the new, the new you know, blossoming Christian church, Peter was called to be, be the, the head, to be the leader, right? Uh, you know, Christ had established that Peter would, would lead in his, in his place as he ascended. But the disciples knew what Peter had just done while Jesus was on trial. That three times Peter had been asked, aren't you the one who followed Jesus? And Peter denied it violently, nastily, denied that he had anything to do with that man, Jesus. So a week and a half later now, they're sitting at the Sea of Galilee, and Jesus looks again at Peter and needs to speak to him in front of the disciples. Sin cannot be ignored. Sin cannot just be, you know, shoved off to the side. It wasn't an elephant in the room, right? It wasn't like Peter and Jesus were like eating their bread, and Jesus is like, so... Peter's like, well, Jesus is like, cool. Peter's like, yeah. No, sin had to be pointed out, but Christ did it in the most amazing, merciful way. Three times Peter had denied him. And so Jesus comes to Peter. He wants to restore Peter. And I want to read these verses from John chapter 21. Gospel of John Gospel of John, chapter 21. And what we're going to do, and we'll read all three of these, uh, these verses, but we're just going to today focus on the question of Jesus. Maybe at this point, I'm not positive, maybe we will get a chance in our next lesson to discuss Peter's answers and Jesus' follow-up commands to him. But at least right now, I want us to focus on the question that Jesus asks Peter. John chapter 21, and we're going to read 15, 16, 17 with a focus on the question Jesus asks him. John 21, 15 through 17. So when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. He said to him again a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? He said, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said, tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he kept asking for a third time, do you love me? He said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. (sighs) Let's focus here on, on the question Jesus asks him three times, right? We, we know this. Uh, some, maybe someone doesn't know that Jesus asked three times because Peter, uh, Peter rejected him three times, denied him three times. But let me ask you, did Jesus already know the answer to these questions? Jesus had predicted Peter's denial He told them before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. Jesus already knew that he was going to deny him. And Jesus already knew that Peter would be restored. Jesus already knew the heart of Peter. He already knew that Peter loved him. That's the reason he's asking him. Peter's not set and perfect and right. Peter is still struggling and trying to figure things out. Remember, he's the guy who put on his clothes to jump into the sea to swim to Jesus, right? Peter's still confused. Jesus already knew the heart of Peter. Yet, as Jesus always does, he investigates before he judges. Jesus always investigates before he judges. And we have learned in previous studies why. He doesn't do it for his own sake. Jesus knows all. He knows already. He doesn't need to investigate for himself. Jesus investigates so that we know the written record. So what is at the very heart of all judgment? This is what this is. John, I mean, sorry, Peter is on trial here in John 21, right? He's on trial. Peter Do you love me? Simon Peter, son of Jonah, do you love me? Peter is on trial. Jesus is investigating. And at the heart of this judgment, at the heart of all judgment, is the basic question. 
Jesus wants to know, do you love me? That is what he wants to know from you. Jesus doesn't ask him for a diary of all the things he's done in the last week and a half. Heaven has the diary. Jesus doesn't need to bring up to Peter and say, dude, you're awful. Like, what'd you do that for? You haven't cussed at a girl, man. What were you doing? He just wants to know the very basic fact. Do you love me? I love this quote here. Desire of Ages, page 815. The question that Christ had put to Peter was significant. He mentioned only one condition of discipleship and service. Do you love me? This is the essential qualification. Though Peter might possess every other gift, yet without the love for Christ, he could not be a faithful shepherd over the Lord's flock. Knowledge, benevolence, eloquence, gratitude, and zeal are all aids in the good work, but without the love of Jesus in the heart. Wow. Wow. The work of the Christian is a failure. You can keep the Sabbath, pay your tithes. You have all the knowledge. Benevolence is, is the desire to do good for others. You can be eloquent. You have gratitude for God. Zeal and excitement in the things that you do. And she says they're aids in the good work. These are good things. But without the love of Jesus in your heart, your work will fail. Your work of drawing closer to Christ will fail if you're not doing it because you love him. The work of cleansing your life of sin will never work if it isn't because you love Christ. So Christian, I have this same question for you today. Do you love him? If you love him, if you truly love him, you will survive the trials and turmoils of life and the trials and turmoils of your own heart, of the sins and the temptations of your own life. He will save you by his grace if you love him. He will help you survive by his strength if you love him. He will guide you by his word if you love him. He will work where you rest if you love him. Life is difficult enough. So don't be too hard on yourself. Don't beat yourself up. Christ was already beaten for you. Love him. And he is working in your life. Don't look at the empty tomb or the empty net of your failure. Love him. Cast your cares upon him. Accept his righteousness by faith. By telling him right now, say it out loud. I love you, Jesus. Say it in your heart. Scream it in your heart that you love Jesus. If you love him, you cannot fail. 